In the Danish National Archives, the oldest description of a seaway through Scandinavia's archipelagos is kept like a secret. Coincidence leads me on the track of this itinerary from the early 13th century. This manuscript is somewhat of a mystery. This Latin document was written by monks and is a listing of 101 waypoints forming a sea route along the east coast of Sweden, over to the Orland Islands and Finland, up to Tallinn. After a month-long research and visits in several museums, I set sails on my 40-year-old Diot La Mer to follow that age-old route description as true to the original as possible. This route was used since the Viking Age and consequently I began my journey in the old settlement of Heiterbu in Germany and sailed over Denmark, southern Sweden and the Kalmar Sound into the archipelagos of Sweden. I'm really curious if sailing this ancient route through this worldwide unique landscape is still possible today. And I hope to find some traces of Scandinavia's history, specifically of the Vikings and their mythology. At home in Hamburg, it must be dark by now. But up here in the north, I lost every sense of time again. When I wake up in the morning, the sun is already high in the skies. And when I disappear in my bunk at night, it is still bright as day. The scent of the onboard barbecue is blending with the aroma of the conifers on the sun warmed scaries. The pinkish rocks are reflecting the warmth of the day, just perfect to warm up again after a bath in the crystal clear island waters. The calm water has this unique Baltic smell and a very special shine. According to the sagas, it was Aegir, the giant responsible for the sea and the foamy beer in the Nordic mythology, who brought so much beer in his gigantic golden kettle in the festival hall that even the always thirsty Vikings had to leave something over. And so, still today, the Baltic appears in a nightly blaze of gold in perfect harmony to the orange-blue skies of the Swedish summer nights. Sometimes I have to kick my own ass to understand what's really happening. So, but it's uh, such a unique experience to be here in the archipelago all alone with my boat. And you do it once or a few times in your life. So, I got to enjoy every second of it. I'm on my way for six weeks now in this dreamlike summer. The waypoints of the itinerary are defining my daily course and routine. Island by island, nautical mile by nautical mile. I'm slowly sailing northeastward through the enchanting archipelagos between Chipping and then so on. And here on Ringsöen, another sunny summer day finds its end. 
It's the second um, place from the old route. Uh, I made a, a stop at Steendoren. The small passage between the mainland and the island Krampe is known for centuries. Steendoren is accessible by car and hence the ideal spot to closely discover the archipelago world of Sweden. At the entrance of the bite, which is often packed during summer, stands an unusual beacon. Kerosene, the fuel for lighthouses, was stored here, away from the settlement. But an individual stopover lies a little more to the east, the island of Öja, with the well-known lighthouse of Landsort. Yeah, this piece of the route had a bit of my respect because it could be quite rough here around Landsort. In um, 2014, I spent here a few days until I could uh, make the passage. I stay here in a bait called uh, Fifong, which should be very, very nice. The bite here at Fifong is not only beautiful, Exploring the island is even more fun. The daily exercise is most welcome compensation for a long day of sailing. Here on Fifong, I locate one of these circular glacier potholes, which seem to be drilled straight inside the rock. In former times, people believed these holes were made by giants as a cattle to cook their meals. Hence, they were called Jettigritta. Today, we know that these potholes were formed by the whirling, melting waters. And the sand and grit did all the work, hollowing out the bedrock. It's interesting that it's a, like a parallel or different kind of life. My usual life stays at home. I don't think too much about it. Uh, I'm just doing my thing here, uh, sailing every day to another place and see what I get from, from my lens. Um, yeah, but it's, it's a funny feeling, like, <laughs> yeah, like the other li life just didn't, doesn't exist for the moment. The next day, I settled my depths with the Öja. As mentioned, I had a real low when I was stuck in stormy weather then, and my respect for passing the island grew daily. Loneliness, it's a long way back. The weather is getting worse. It looks like uh, it was a little bit too easy. And now I have to get used to some tougher conditions. I just took an excursion boat to the island and looked over the troubled waters. But this time I reached the harbor easy and unspectacular by my own means. Sailing is always depending on the weather. And what looks threateningly one day seems idyllic the next day. As there was nothing else to see there, I proceeded to the harbor of Ankarun. I experienced one of the meanwhile uncounted but still stunning sunrises on my journeys and was glad about my, compared to the tremendous nature, small human life. One day Odin took a very close look at the world around him. He saw the worlds of the gods, the giants, the elves and the dwarves. He saw fire, rocks and ice. But with Midgard, Odin had created yet another world a world full of lush meadows, green forests, and surrounded by an endless ocean edged by the enormous Midgard serpent. But he was missing something, something that should bring real life to Midgard, the human beings. These were created with the help of two more gods of the Aesir, 
using a pair of dead logs which they'd found on the shore. Odin imbued them with life, Hunar with spirit and soul, and Loki with human appearance and the warmth. And Ask and Embla, Ash and Elm, were created out of a mixture of seawater, consisting of the blood of the first god, Ymir, and the wood of the trees. The incarnation of trees is a widespread belief in other mythologies. Whereas the Nordic Dwarfs consists of a mixture of Ymir's blood and the rocks. The human population grew fast. They founded settlements, plowed the ground and built ships to travel the impassable Scandinavian terrain. Every single destiny is watched, ruled and directed by the three Norns. Urd, that which became, Verdandi, that which is happening, and Skuld, that which should become. Let's see what these ladies have in store for me, because I am sailing on the waters of Midgard to a new height of my journey. The itinerary again names two alternatives for a safe passage of the stormy cape at Lansort. Ships following the inner route of the sea itinerary definitely had to cross a strait between Sverdsand and Eckholmen. And then it went through the Dragets Canal. It's um, a small channel um, built uh, in modern times. There wouldn't have been a channel centuries ago, but the sea here was about three meters higher due to the land uplift. So boats could have been carried over the narrow passage. The Scandinavian name Draget has exactly that meaning, and edges some places like the Drag Sound or the Drag Bergen are confirming the importance of the spot. The passage would have been only doable for small and light boats, while the big and heavy cogs had to take the long way around. Only one boat at a time can make the passage, so it's mandatory to sound the ship's horn long and clear. Once inside the channel, there is no way back. It seems that I can touch both rock faces with my arms stretched out. After the passage, I'm relaxing a bit on a small jetty, having just enough draw from my boat. When the fire burns down in the ember slow. On the opposite side lays Eckholm. And near my jetty lay a tar pit hundreds of years ago, where boats and ropes could have been conserved also on the way. In these small and wooden passages here, with always changing directions of the wind and the boat course, I make good use of my diesel. There obviously had been a lot of rowing formerly, and I asked myself if, like with the Roman galleys, it was a job for the slaves on the Viking ships. But Paul Wilson of the Rosala Viking Center knows better. Yeah, but that, that, what is interesting is that the Vikings, even if they had slaves on the boat, they, they did the rowing themselves. They say that they didn't use slaves for rowing, even if they had them on the boat. So I don't know exactly why, but, but it was maybe a principle. I resupply with water and food after the lonely days in the archipelago world in Nina's Hamm where I find a busy yacht and ferry harbour. The mighty car ferries are leaving here for a few hours trip to Gotland, the island amid the Baltic Sea that I want to visit with my own boat on my way back. When leaving Nina Sam, I'm already in the southern Stockholm archipelago. Lonely days in Scandinavia's nature, and under the branches of the world tree Yggdrasil, a line ahead of me. After Ymir's brutal death, Yggdrasil is the first tree which grows over all nine worlds. 
Its branches are extending over all the heavens. Yggdrasil has three mighty roots. One is growing into the icy Niflheim, where the dragon Nidhuggr is gnawing on it. Another root goes to the Utenheim, the land of the giants. The third root finally goes to Asgard, in the world of the gods holding court under the tree's branches. At its foot lies the well of Erd, where the Norns dictate the destiny of the humans and are keeping the tree evergreen with the well's water. In the crown of the world, Ash lives a nameless eagle. Between his eyes sits a hawk. And like a scheming mischief maker, the squirrel Ratatosk climbs up and down between the creatures in the crown and the root gnawing dragons and snakes spreading the worst rumors. An early form of a yellow press, bringing lots of quarrel and brawl in the Nine Worlds. When Yggdrasil starts to wilt, the end of the world, the Ragnarok, is near. The last battle of the giants against the gods, leaving the world burning. But previously, the Midgard serpent creeps upon the land, which will then be flooded. Nagalfar, the ship of the dead, rises upon the water with the force of the evil on board. Nagalfar is made entirely from the fingernails and toenails of the dead, and to at least delay the Ragnarok, the nails of all the deceased Vikings were cropped thoroughly before the burial. My hair, however, was cropped so thoroughly after some language problems that not only I'm starting to look like Ragnar Lodbrok from the TV series Vikings, but I'm also very happy to be a single-handed sailor until my hair grows back. And after some more dreamlike archipelago sailing, I am passing Melston nach Natarö. I'm here on one of the few islands with sandy beaches in the archipelago. It's called Natarö, a little bit of Caribbean lifestyle. never seen such a gorgeous sand beach up here and directly savor the South Sea atmosphere for some hours. This beach would have been perfect to land here with the shallow keel Viking ships. I'm using a kind of uh, backdoor so a shortcut to uh, Ute. This route needs some nerves again. It starts by winding narrowly through the islands and later through a tightly buoyed fairway with a little water under the keel. Too bad that even after the end of the fairway the water will not get deeper and I need to creep with minimal speed and always an expectation of touching the ground. <laughs> Nevertheless, often these passages are the most satisfying ones. Yeah, baby! In this good temper, I'm reaching Ute, which was populated first by the Vikings, as an inaccessible gravesite in the south of the island indicates. Around 1150, iron ore was found and mined at Ute, which formed the island strongly. Even if the archipelago world looks empty and inhospitable at first sight, Everywhere were important resources available. After the end of the 17th century, nine mining plants operated here, until the plague and the Nordic Wars forced the islanders to leave. Today, Ute is a very popular harbor in the archipelago, totally packed during the season with 300,000 visitors a year. But as there are still some days left to the start of the season, I have a wonderful mooring place in front of the harbor office. The order of naming Ute in the itinerary is odd, and it does not make any geographic sense. From Melston to Ute, and then Nautaru. 
then or le, and then or ne. But as I could not find a better explanation so far, I'm assuming an error while writing down or communicating the route. Because this would only be human. One more reason to follow this old route is that I'm, um, that I'm finding places which I usually um, won't find. Uh, like today here at uh, Ornö, and uh, it's really cozy here and I, I feel very, very comfortable around one hut where everything goes. The wind picks up again and I'm staying for two nights in this very sheltered bay. I'm again straying the area, finding a church with an interesting graveyard. To earn a place at Odin's table in Valhalla, a Viking warrior must lose his life in battle. Odin gathered his best fighters in this mighty hall with 504 doors in Asgard to fight the Ragnarok. Through each of the doors, 800 of the chosen warriors could walk into battle side by side. To find these warriors, Odin's Valkyries were hovering over the battlefields looking for the strongest and the toughest fighters. Those were then instantly killed during the battle and their souls were brought to Valhalla by the Valkyries. Here it was fighting till you drop during the days and drinking till you drop at night. Obviously a paradisiacal conception for every Viking fighter. And there were those sailors who were drowned in the ocean. They were caught in the nets of Ygir's wife Run and then brought to another special realm of the dead. And of course, there were the non-fighting population, dying a so-called straw debt, that is, by illness or simply old age. These souls landed in the dark empire of the goddess Hell, with no hope of escape. Older warriors might have sought an honorable debt in the battle in order to make their way to Valhalla in time. Maybe this is the reason for the well-known valiance of the Viking warriors, and maybe also for the conversion to Christianity, with its a little bit more peaceful concept of an eternal life. With the underworld of hell, we now know all nine worlds of the Nordic mythology. It's time now for Search in Iraq. Next on my list for today is a little diving. I'm here on Jungfruskeer and I'm diving for the so-called Kukmaren wreck, one of the oldest so-called cocks in Sweden. It was built around 1215 and uh, sunk a few years after. The Swedes have a very relaxed attitude towards their archaeological finding spots. You can find these coordinates simply in the internet. I'm very curious if I will find anything here. Drop my anchor in the sheltered bite at Jungfruskeer and row my dinghy to the main coordinates. Lo and behold, without a mark or barriers, you can see the skeleton of a shipwreck in one and a half meters depth. Due to the land uplift, it would have been around five meters then. But what's the story about this wreck? The Kukmauen wreck in the Stockholm archipelago is of very um, great interest. Uh, provenance indicates that uh, the timber was cut uh, in Jutland, which makes it very interesting because it uh, could have been part of the uh, strike force fleet against Estonia from um, König Valdemar. It was this Danish king who had ordered the transcription of the itinerary from southern Sweden to Tallinn. And even if the exact purpose of the itinerary is yet unclear, one can expect a military background. And evidence of military movements along the route would be a very good indicator. 
the macrobotanical analysis of uh, some of the bilge content has uh, shown that there was some barley in the rack. Barley was uh, used as horse fodder. This is a very interesting finding because another wreck uh, south, uh, south of the Kukmaran wreck, uh, also from the same century, also uh, had barley and other grain on board. So there, there seems to emerge a certain pattern. The Danes transported horses to Tallinn uh, as they had a royal stable there. The Danes uh, bred uh, very large war horses and uh, they had a natural advantage over the uh, Estonians in that respect. And, um, but that is also one reason why the Danes or other crusaders in the north um, preferred the winter to carry out uh, war campaigns. When the rivers and bogs are frozen over, they are natural uh, um, transport arteries, and uh, especially the rivers, they were like medieval highways. Due to the close proximity of the wreck and its connection to my journey, this evening at Anchor feels very exciting. And in my mind, I'm again jumping through the centuries. Imagining the crew of the stranded cog leaving the flooded ship and went away. These are sheltered conditions, so uh, the wreck was probably given up there, probably because it was not seaworthy anymore, and um, so there might have been a controlled uh, grounding of the vessel so that all the cargo could be retrieved. Maybe to save the ship and its load, or just to survive. I will never know. And it seems that I'm the only one in this big bite giving a thought about that matter. But now I imagine changing my La Mer to a small Viking cargo boat heading for Berka and the Lake Melaren and leaving the outer route of the itinerary. No merchant of the Vikings would have passed by Berka, this important commercial center here in the north. And I also set sails, heading west, while dreaming of a red-white Viking sail on my mast. Had there been marks in former days, Similar with all the small lighthouses all around me, leading the way for seafarers. There have been found beacons here, here along the coastal line, but it's hard to know exactly how old they are. They're made of stone usually, and, and it's hard to know when they were set up. They have been used through, through the ages here in the archipelago to, to help uh, merchants navigate. But there also had been route descriptions naming more prominent attributes of the Terran. If you start reading the descriptions in the sagas of how they describe the coastline, you can also see that the words they give is, that's the nose of the head of that mountain coming out. And when you sail that way, it looks like a head and a nose sticking out. And then you go around and, and you've got elbows and ears and necks and knees and everything. And uh, places called a horse head or a helmet or things they could recognize from a daily uh, wording, but also that when you see it on the horizon, you, see, you recognize it as what they called it. Because there are no indications in the sagas that they have this uh, helicopter view that we have today. I mean, we take out, we take out an nautical chart and say, oh, yes, I see it from, as it is a satellite photo. Um, but there are no descriptions in, in the old text indicating that they had that worldview. After three days without electricity, um, refrigerator and a bunch of dirty clothes, I choose a harbor um, where I can fix all these problems. It's called Salzjubaden. It's very close to uh, Stockholm, very crowded. 
Uh, not exactly my kind of place, but I must say after all these um, lonely days in the archipelagos, it's not that bad. But for these exorbitant mooring fees, I was entertained at the entrance at the harbor by 50 mother naked women doing a workout on a rock. As I learned later, it was the outdoor area of a women's sauna. And they did not seem to care about this ostentation, looking like apes on the rock in a zoo. But still, I could not venture to grip my camera. Yeah, and suddenly I'm in the hustle and bustle of Stockholm's metropolitan area. There is a shortcut from here to the center of Stockholm, also mentioned in the itinerary. In the 16th century, the cartographer Lars Magnus describes the southern entrance as a bite with numerous underwater reefs constantly narrowing until leading to the stain door, the stone gate. Thousands of invaders lost their lives here, and the stone gate was dreaded even more than the battle rose itself. Today this narrow but still navigable passage is called Baggenstegit and is framed by the villas of some very wealthy Stockholmians. An architect might feel better here than a skipper with only inches of water under the keel again. But still, I really do enjoy this urban passage of my sailing trip. Later, I am passing another waypoint of the itinerary. An island at the gates of Stockholm. And just after a blink, I am amid the big city. The Tivoli lies to my right, and the docks of the many cruise ships reaching Stockholm every day to my left. I am directly heading to the port side and continue to Slussen, the lock to Lake Milan. The sea chart for this area was accidentally left at home, so I had no VHF channel or even opening times for Slussen. But all worked out well, and only an hour later I set my course to Birke, the former Viking trading place, Birke. Björke lies so deep inside the land that the passage with the little wind and the increasing motorboat traffic of the weekend becomes endless and tenacious. In the Viking Age, this lake was still an open bite of the Baltic Sea. My arrival at Birke fits my imagination and I feel like being set 1000 years back in the Viking Age as a time aligns to the dock of the island. After a long and quite boring journey down the Lake Millar and I arrived here at Birka. It was one of the most important settlements during the Viking Age uh, concerning trade to the east. And uh, yeah, it was populated between the 8th and 10th century. And I have a look around. The island is home to a museum, the reconstruction of a Viking settlement, including a harbor and gardens, and offers the usual quantity of Viking-style touristic knick-knack. These helmets are simply an invention of Richard Wagner's costume designers. Not only had they been impractical and risky in a battle due to the horns, but they were also simply too expensive for the average Viking. Armaments were only available for some high-ranking persons, and there are extremely few findings of this kind. The usual Viking prefers to be light and fast and was wearing a wadded wool or leather jacket in combination with a leather cap. Berka is named as Sweden's first city, even though in the time of Berka there was no state-like structure called Sweden or even cities at all in today's meaning. But Berka was structured like a modern city with a garrison, an industrial and residential area. In the 200 years of the economic and political expansion of the Vikings, here in the east called Varangians, by the way, trading was mostly an exchange of goods. Traded were the widely available amber, furs and horns, as well as high-grade iron. In exchange, there were silver coins, which were melted down to jewelry, glass pearls and glass cups, as well as silk, spicery and ceramics. Also, the slave trade was an important economic factor. 
In the beginning of Berka, trading took place in the whole Baltic area. Later, the journeys went over the Russian rivers to the Islamic Caliphate and to Constantinople. These boats here were used for an expedition over the Russian rivers in the last year. It seems that these types of boats, including the cargo, are way too heavy to be carried by the crew. So, there are still some more mysteries to solve to explain the trade with the Orient. I am spending some more time at this historical site. But eventually, the heat forces me in the shadows and I start thinking. Unlike me, the Viking traders were traveling not only for months, but years and were constantly in danger. But certainly, they could earn more with just one trading journey than in a whole life on a farm at home. A typical trader's longhouse accommodated three generations of 10 to 15 family members. The big table was for eating and household chores, and the benches at the walls were also used as beds. The place near the fireside was the warmest, and with increasing status and age, your sleeping berth moved nearer to the fire. The two slaves, which were typically used for primitive work, slept farthest away from the heat. There was no chimney, only a hole in the roof, and the smell of smoke was passive. But it was warm, dry, And there was always enough to eat and to tell in a trader's home. How many adventurous tales had been taken to the trader's graves? Anyway, at Berka, over 2,300 grave sites had been found, and above all of them stands the cross of the monk Ansgar, who for a long time tried in vain to Christianize Berka. Why the people abandoned Berka at the end of the 10th century is yet unknown. But I really want to leave this motorboat contaminated landlocked area now and sail back to the Baltic Sea and the familiar solitude of the Archipelagos. It's not uh, easy now to, to find a very good route because um, there are three routes involved now and I have to make a, a choice where I go and it's also very, very dependent on the weather. It is partially bizarre to share the tight fairways through the scaries with the mighty cruise ships which appear oddly out of place here. On my way to the Stockholm archipelago, I make a stop over here in Vaxholm, the so-called capital of the Stockholm archipelago. And uh, I must say, it's very nice here. Um, it's um, restaurants and, and, and coffees and a little bit of Mediterranean lifestyle. The waterways are getting tighter and void and the inner calm comes back. I pass another well-known navigational mark in the archipelago. The Mansuren grave marker, honoring the glorified Swedish regatta sailor John Carlson. Due to his profession as a glazier, he was called glass color. But others claiming it refers to his distinct fondness for a good grog. Anyway, it is an old sailor's tradition now to raise the glass to color when passing the marker. But for me, it's early days yet for a grog. I got up at 4.30 in the morning. Uh, it's not that hard here because it's uh, always uh, bright light, so it feels like uh, middle of the day. 
and uh, I went here to um, Sec. Despite the changing winds, I have a beautiful mooring place at the rocks and strip off the hecticness of the urban region. Deep resounding violence of two hearts beating for each other in the quiet stillness I'm reminded of what it means to love another And once more, I dedicate myself to the construction of my sundial compass. Here is now the full explanation of its function. What we have here is uh, a replica of what we uh, call a sundial compass. Basically, the functionality of it is that in the morning the sun rises and it's very low in the horizon. So the little nail in the middle here makes a long shadow and will make a mark on the shadow here on the disc. Then as the sun rises during the day, then the shadow grows shorter. And then in the evening as the sun sets again, then the shadow grows longer again. So during that day, we can make a line of marks on the disc. And then as we go out sailing again, if we spin the disc so that the shadow from the little nail again touches the line that I made in land, the disc will be in the same position as when I made the disc in land. And that will work when I'm out on the boat. But because the boat is, is, is moving, I need some weight to sort of gimbal it to keep it steady and keep it level. This is a, a replica of a, a disc that was found in Unatok in Greenland. And the disc had two curves. One was for midsummer and one was for the, the day in the spring where the day and night is equally long. Um, and of course, those lines change during the year, but it also changes with your latitude on the, on, the, on the planet when you're going farther, north or south. First, and only by navigating with landmarks, they sailed to the correct latitude, located the northerly direction there, and carved the topical curve into the compass surface. In the old Icelandic sagas, there's a description from Herna near Bergen in Norway to Valf in Greenland. Keep sailing west, and then you are sailing north of Shetland, so that it can only be seen if visibility is very good but south of the Faroes so that the sea appears halfway up their mountain slopes. But so far south of Iceland that only one becomes aware of birds and whales from it. When you reach the east coast of Greenland, watch out for special landmarks and follow the westerly current. Sail around the Cape, then you reach the settlements at the southwest headland. When you look at the chart, you see the route is consequently following the latitude of 61 degrees north. And only with Greenland in sight, the course was altered. Yes, after a quiet night yesterday at uh, SEC, I have a wonderful breeze from the north. So I can uh, make a mark to all these waypoints I missed by going to Birka and uh, Stockholm. So now I'm heading south, have a look at Stafsuda, Storajelö, at um, Bergham, at Rummerö, maybe at the horizon. And then I will go uh, eastwards to Ekne. Let's see how it looks like.
The waypoints here are so close together that it's just a question of a few miles to make a check mark. And offering no anchoring or harbors. So at the end of the day, I'm reaching Sandham, the mecca of the sailing sport. I'm not choosing the big regatta harbor in the city, but instead the more hidden and smaller harbor of the Royal Swedish Sailing Club on the island of Lökholmen, featuring an old fortification. The pilot village of Sandham offered the last sheltered harbor in direction to the Baltic States then. Here you have a lookout over the open sea in eastward direction. In view of the wideness of the sea and the distance to Tallinn, I again start pondering. I'm a bit uh, afraid going back alone with a boat, Estonia, Gotland, Holland, and then back to Germany. It sounds not, yeah, sounds easy, but with this old boat, I mean, I'm old as well. We all got our scratches and and still holding together. So I hope we will manage it. La mer, huh? Come on. I consistently ignored the journey back and don't even have sea charts for Estonia and Gotland with me. I'm only certain to take the way over the open sea and not sailing through the sheltered archipelagos again. To forget these concerns, I take a closer look at Sandham using the free of charge shuttle boat service of the marina. The domiciles of the village are cute, and I really could have liked it here. But in the end, it is somehow too touristy. For example, you can't eat the low-priced lunch special on the terrace, which is exclusively for the tourists drinking champagne, and you must sit in the heat of the dark restaurant instead. Such details don't taint the optical charm of the village, but let me leave the island faster as expected, and I hurry back to my harbor on the fortification island. And the next morning, I'm leaving early on my way north. I uh, just uh, tied my boat to Bockel because it's a very pretty natural reserve and I want to uh, check out my, my kayak and I uh, wanted to stay here but it's not easy to find a safe sheltered place. There are uh, motorboats, two times my, my keel touches the ground and it would be possible but it's just not fun. Uh, sailing is just more fun today and I learned one thing about sailing is uh, you never push it. On the island of Möja, I discover a jetty at Ramsmora, where I can moor nicely. The island offers several harbors, but this one has the most archipelago atmosphere.
I need to resupply again and take a walk all the long way to Longweek, the northerly harbor of the island with its steep cliffs, where there is supposed to be a small supermarket. The way goes right through the nature and offers everything that I love so much about Sweden. The nightly atmosphere here in the harbor brings the romantic to a new peak. Once again, I'm browsing through my Viking books, finding an interesting information here that fits perfectly inside this harbor. When the sea is raging and the towering waves are rising up to swallow ships whole, this is the doing of the hard-drinking giant Aegir. To keep him calm, humans captured in raids are sacrificed before dangerous sea voyages. And even at ship launchings, he would get his share. The Vikings tie a person of no value to the planks which they use to push their boats into the water. The blood on the keel mixes with the water, giving hope that the gods don't claim any more human sacrifices from the boat. The next morning, I notice a distressing fact. Yeah, my Swedish part of the journey is almost over. Uh, right after the horizon are the Orland Islands and uh, my harbor to get there is Aholma, which is uh, only 22 miles away. So I guess uh, it's, uh, these are the last days in Sweden. And I like to go sailing today, though the wind is not very good right now. But um, I want to see two or three places which I personally love very much. For a start, I circle Myrja through a narrow passage in the north. My first destination, aside of the route description, is the Parodisviken, with its already parodisical approach. During the season, it is hopelessly packed here. But once again, I find a wonderful and lonesome anchoring at the rocks. The people of the north carry a huge craving for the life-giving sun. Only in the northern latitudes, the sun establishes the eternal change of spring, summer, autumn and winter. The people of the south, however, suffer from the sun burning the whole year through. For them, she means not life, but death. Hence, the biggest celebrations of the Vikings were those of the seasons. For example, they celebrated the feasts of the equinox. The rebirth of the life-giving sun was celebrated with the winter solstice. But the biggest ceremony of all took place at midsummer, on the 21th of June and is still celebrated today all over Scandinavia. I might already be on the Orland Islands on that day. Zorup. Now I'm taking off some more waypoints of the itinerary. Und Österland. Number two of my special requests is the swinging bridge at Klinsundet. First, you must make a phone call to the master of the bridge. Yes, uh, I want to pass the Klinsundet bridge in like 15 to 20 minutes. Would that be possible? who 15 minutes later operates the bridge with muscular strength. Hey, thank you. It is very shallow here, but slowly and with great care, I pass the access channel to proceed to my next special request, Shirkogatsuen, an island fortified with huge amounts of concrete.
I ain't attracted by the cannons, bunker, or the concrete. Even though the combination, together with the ugly cruise ships, provokes some weird thoughts. There's a youth hostel with three pretty nice ladies who are cooking. There's a buffet. For a lonesome sailor like me, it's a little bit like uh, being home. So I like it here very, very much. In addition, I get a relatively lonely mooring place and an idyllic sauna. And so my stay is once more longer than planned. But the brilliant weather conditions had put me way ahead of my schedule. So I can afford it easily and relaxed. I'm starting to work on my sundial compass, which falls apart today. And it pretty much uh, looks like this piece which was found in Greenland. So. In the winter, I was full of sorrows if I could manage this, if I would really get even here uh, with this boat, because you see all these problems, all these uh, things that need to be fixed. I only had to strengthen the stern due to the additional outboard engine, made an improvised repair for the broken stop cable of the diesel and had to replace a pump. That was it. The gods had taken good care of me so far. I'm on the last 10 miles in Sweden in uh, direction Aholma. You can taste and feel the open sea. So I changed my clothes again to more open water style, back from the archipelago bathing style. The shores are covered with houses and nice moorings are nowhere to be seen. So I'm just ticking off the last waypoints as you don't need them here for navigation. And then the archipelago strolling of the last weeks comes to an end. We are close to midsummer and I'm already out and about for 10 weeks. Yeah, funny how this view got uh, normal for me. Uh, one year ago I got up at four and in the morning in Hamburg, took a ferry to Sweden and then drove 800 kilometers just to have this kind of view. And now it's a daily, daily business, but I can't um, cheer it every day. Um, yeah, funny, I know in a, in a few months I will miss it very much. Whether the troops of King Valdemar, the Varangians or me, we were and are aware of the danger by leaving the sheltered archipelago and sailing over the rough Orland Sea with the second lowermost part of the Baltic in a depth of over 300 meters. For my crossing to the Arland Islands, pretty much wind is forecasted, but luckily out of the right direction. It will become choppy, but no real challenge. Anyway, I thoroughly prepare my boat, check all systems, and prepare my Orland flag and the sundial compass. And then, in the wee small hours, I start the passage to a different country. Now, let us imagine a crew in the Viking Age before going on a long journey. At first, it needs some waiting for favorable weather conditions. When you, when you read all the descriptions from the Viking Age, that was how they did. They would sail into a position where they would know from here, I can find the islands or I can find that fjord, and they would wait. And they would wait for what they would call a favorable wind. 
which doesn't have to be a, a win from the back, but it's just you don't have to tag. Because it, once you start tagging, your mental map of where you are is going to be very, very difficult to keep updated. So if you just keep one straight line and accept that the sun is moving at a certain pace around you and the weather system also changes a little, you will be okay to, to keep that course. As there had been no weather forecast then, runes with different meanings drawn out of a bag had to give advice. And the journey started not before the outlook seemed positive. There was a navigator the crew entrusted with their lives. This valuable man on board had a determined exact north and had carved the topical curve into the sundial compass before leaving the land. In addition, he had marked the current positions of the rising and setting sun on a disk, which shows eight cardinal points, the so-called Etia. When sailing early or late in the year, the polar or other fixed stars could be used for navigation in a starry night. But look at this shot of the night sky in June. Navigation by using the stars was simply impossible in the Nordic summer. The helmsman became now evenly important as the navigator. At first landmarks could have been used, but after these had disappeared below the horizon, real skills were necessary. Because a little alteration from the course caused a mile-wide deviation from the desired destination. All senses were used to steer, but mostly wind and wave directions were used, which needed a lot of practice. When we're doing these navigations without instruments, we're actually using the whole boat as a piece of the instrument we're seeing it from. So we could put telltales on and then just see that. Our experience is that, on the other hand, that they get sort of uh, torn a little from the uh, shape of the wind. It's a bit like if you can't feel where the wind is and you can't feel it's changing, you, you should stay home. Uh, or you should train enough that you can actually find out. Because of course you can feel that this, the wind comes from here or it comes from here. And if you're a little in doubt, just turn your face. And even if you, it's a little interesting, if you take your hat off or your you know, sort of cap off so you can feel it on your ears and open your mouth just slightly and go like that. And you can definitely feel it. Am I straight in the wind or am I a little off to one of the sides? And especially if you started out practicing as much as you can by maybe just putting your hat over the compass and say, okay, for the next hour, I'll look at my boat and see where are the shadows from the rigging. And you need to train your mind to find out how long is an hour. And the sun's movement, 15 degrees, by the way, is from the back of your fist to the point of your thumb when you aim with one eye over that one. Then maybe your arm is a little longer than mine, but then your hand is bigger than mine. So it actually works quite well for 15 degrees. That's how much the sun moves in an hour. And then you have to train your mental map and you have to train your inner, inner clock. How is the time going? And then accept that the shadows on your boat move a little and you still keep your course. And then after one hour, check the head off the compass and see how much off am I? And then check with your GPS whether you did like that or you did like that. And then slowly by slowly you, you, you can add distance and time to it. Now it was the navigator's task to check the course with all means. But it also means that you need to sharpen your senses on everything else that's going on around you. Everything from change of color in the water to a change of temperature to a different smell. If all of a sudden you can smell the pine trees or someone uh, cut the grass or, or the fields um, then that smell actually carries over water and you can smell the land uh, before you can see it sometimes, depending on how dark the, the night or how much fog there is. The movement of the boat changes as you go from deeper water to more shallow water. The wave pattern changes a little. You can start seeing waves hitting rocks will reflect back and you can actually see how they, they make sort of a, a, a herringbone pattern between the waves. If you're really trained, you can actually see the distance and the direction to the island or the rock just from the wave pattern. A very good tool for verifying the course was the sundial compass. But here, on my rolling boat, the weaknesses of my self-construction are distinct. In principle, it works as supposed, but putting the end of the shadow perfectly on the curve is very tough. The reasons are the uneven surface, the little bit too small diameter of the disc, plus the too short shadow. Especially during noon it becomes very imprecisely. I absolutely must make some corrections here. Three times a day the course could be determined quite well. 
Around noon, and especially during sunrise and sunset, by lining up the bearings made at land with the sun at the horizon, you could easily make a reading of direction north, and with that, of your course. One of the other instruments that we actually have written descriptions that they did use was this, the, the famous sunstone. Basically, it works in the, in the way that it, it splits the light. So you can actually, when you put it on some text, you can see how it, it actually slides the letters across to each other. But I can also use it putting a marker on it. If I look straight up through the stone, and there needs to be a little patch of blue sky above me, then I can actually find the direction to the sun by spinning the, 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 the stone a little. So that shadow maker, shadow marker I put here, will split out in two shadows. And as I spin the, 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 the stone, one will be very dark and one will be very light. And then at one point they'll have the same shade of gray to them and that will be the direction for the sun. But sometimes I need a reference point. So that can be the rising and setting points of the sun. And if it sets below the horizon, it will have a big patch of orange light. Somewhere in that area is the sun. And that's where you can use this stone to actually pinpoint exactly. The sun is not there, it's not there, it's right there. So then you can go from a like 60 degree inaccuracy down to a couple of degrees inaccuracy with the sunstone. And even clouds could have been of enormous help. When you're in the open water, you have moist sea air being pushed over the mountains. And then when the air falls down on the other side of the mountain, then they form a cloud much higher than the mountain. And so it could be located from far away. Another known aid were the nourishing points of the whales, as well as seabirds, which always flew to the land in the evening. Seagulls that go out and eat, but they sleep at night in the, on, on the island. They go about 60 to 70 nautical miles off the coast to, to eat. And at night, when the night falls, you see they all fly in the same direction to go home. So that's one indicator, uh, which also means that instead of that's the size of the island, all of a sudden you can get 60, 70 nautical miles in addition to both sides. Only if the skies were completely covered due to fog, rain or snow, so it is written in the Sagas, the navigator became half villa, unoriented. He could then also use some very own methods. There's even a description from the Shetland Islands that when they were rowing back to the islands and there was heavy fog, you would have the youngest boy on board throwing small rocks out in the front as long as it went splash, and they would keep rowing. And as soon as it went dunk, because it hit a rock, you would have to stop the boat and see, where are we? <laughs> By the way, still during World War II, small and open boats of the Norwegians navigated to the Shetland Islands without the help of instruments. The necessary knowledge was kept a secret and was inherited from generation to generation. A good navigator was a sought after and wealthy man, not only during the Viking Age. And after seven and a half hours of fast sailing, with me getting a little seasick for the first time ever, I am reaching the Orland Islands. A true Baltic sailor's dream. A wildly romantic and politically autonomic island world belonging to Finland. Well, only eight nautical miles to the approach to the Orland Islands and Maria Hamm. One of a kind in the European Union, selling buildings for residential purposes is prohibited. But I am more attracted to the hidden charms of the Orland Islands as I am to the attractions. And so I moor at the small scary of Stegsker. Going on such a long journey is the dream of many people and I am very, very thankful for being able to do this for the second time in my life now. Old age comes often faster as favored, and it then might be too late for fulfilling your travel dreams. And even if my wealth after the long journey is not material, the amount of experience will be something I can live on for the rest of my life. And I'm really trying to make every second count as if it would never come back. And on stakes scale, I bring back the pictures of the last week. All the bright Swedish summer nights in the archipelago. The simple life on the water with and inside the nature. I had already come so far, the rest will be no problem now. 
If only the damned long and completely unplanned return would not lie ahead. And it will not be an easy one, but this I will tell you in the next episode of The Viking Route.